and welcome to a special edition of Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm Ben Max, executive editor of Gotham Gazette. Tom DiNapoli has been the state controller since 2007, when he was appointed to the position amid scandal that saw his predecessor removed from office. DiNapoli was re-elected to the position by voters across the state in 2010 and again in 2014. He is running for another term this fall. As controller, Mr. DiNapoli is one of just four state-level, statewide elected officials, and he has massive, important powers that may not always be in the headlines, but are essential to the health of the state. The controller is responsible for, among other things, the $200-plus billion state pension fund, auditing state agencies and state contracts, reporting on state finances, and generally speaking, ensuring that state and local governments use taxpayer money effectively and efficiently to promote the common good, as the Comptroller's website puts it. Comptroller DiNapoli is often host shows here on Represent NYC, but today he's my guest for this conversation about the work of his office, why it is important to you and the state overall, and this year's elections. Welcome, Comptroller. Good to see you. Thank you, Ben. Um, so I captured a little bit of the power scope of the office, but how do you put it? How do you yeah. capture what the state controller does. Yeah. I think you did a good job on, on certainly some of the main areas that we focus on. I always say I have the best job in state government, the one that most people don't know a lot <laughs> about what we do. We are the Office of Accountability, and I think especially uh, as we navigate through continuing challenging times, how money is being spent, taxpayers are very, very concerned about that, issues of transparency, of openness. Uh, so those are, I, I think, the, the underpinnings of, of the overall work that we do. So that accountability agenda certainly uh, is referenced in the work we do with our audits, you know, as you mentioned. So we audit state agencies. We audit, um, well, not quite the same uh, uh, ability, uh, but public authorities, uh, state and local uh, public authorities, and then local governments. New York City, although in the city you have an independently elected city controller that does much of that work, but we do some audits in the city as well, and certainly local governments uh, outside of New York City. So I always try to remind people, we don't decide how the money's going to be spent in terms of what program areas get what amount of dollars, but we are the office that follows where that money is going, and we make sure that the money is being spent as intended by the governor and the legislature, the money's being spent pursuant to the requirements of state law and, 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 and state statutes. So that's a big part of, of our workforce, a big part of what we do. We approve uh, state contracts. So if you're a, a business or a vendor and you have a, a contract with the state, you're a nonprofit and you're providing services that you're getting money uh, for from the state or you're a local government getting a grant, we are the office that would review uh, the merits of the contract and then we, we follow through on, on the payments as well. We do the nuts and bolts uh, back office operation. We pay uh, state employees. We make sure they get their paycheck and we process all payments for the state. That's another opportunity for oversight making sure that the state's not being defrauded in those cases. You mentioned the pension fund, and we're very proud of the fact that not just our size, which is substantial, we're the third largest public pension fund in the nation, but we're also among the best funded. Pew Research Center just came out with their ranking. Earlier this year, we're one of only four state pension plans out of the 50 in the country that are over 90% funded. So ensuring retirement security, uh, hopefully at a, at a cost that taxpayers can afford, uh, that investment work is very, very key, uh, and uh, as you know, we're a very active and engaged shareholder with the companies that, that we uh, invest in. Commenting on state fiscal practices, but also, uh, which you referenced, but also looking at broader policy issues. So we have done white papers or research reports on issues like uh, affordable housing in the state, uh, disparate health care outcomes, finding too many cases where communities of color fall behind. Uh, other communities in terms of, of outcomes on asthma, diabetes, obesity, and some other some other measurements. Uh, we administer the state's oil spill fund. Most people don't know that. So when there's a problem, it needs to be a cleanup. And um, there are so many other areas. The, the last one I'll mention uh, is uh, unclaimed funds, where we return New Yorkers' lost money. Uh, nice people always get a mm -hmm. smile on their face when government is, you know, people say thank you. I say, well, well, we're not giving you something. It's your money. We've just been holding it in safekeeping. Uh, many New Yorkers don't realize how easy it is to get separated from your money, a check that wasn't cashed, an old bank account that, you know, went dormant. Uh, and uh, we have some uh, over $14 billion worth of, of unclaimed fund accounts. So and you should, you should check. check. Yeah, go yeah, check yeah. online. We've made it easy online. But returning that money, we're returning over um, 
I think it's about a million and a half dollars a day now that we're returning. So we've been very aggressive in trying to put that money back in people's pockets. So wide scope. It's yeah. it's a lot. And and again, it's uh, I think you said it well. People are not as familiar with the breadth and depth of what we do, but all of it's very important and we try to keep a very steady hand on what's happening. There've been a lot of changes in the years I've been controller. Governors have come and gone, mm -hmm. leaders have come and gone, attorney generals have come and gone. I think it's important that in the controller's office uh, that we have a steady hand, and that's certainly what I've tried to provide. Right, that's a good point. There's been quite a bit of stability in that office compared to others. Uh, so speak a little bit more to um, your monitoring the fiscal health of the state. How is the state doing? And not only how is it doing, but what's the economic forecast from where you sit right now? How do, how do things look as we sit in July of 2018? Yeah. We've seen some federal changes. Yeah. Um, the New York City economy is certainly doing very well, but there's areas of the state not doing so well. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, do you, how do you see both the, yeah. the fiscal health of the state and the economic outlook? Yeah. I mean, certainly we're in much better shape than we were a few years ago. The, the Great Recession hit us very, very hard. Uh, really all sectors of the economy. Uh, billions of dollars lost in revenue for state and local government. Uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs that were lost. We've bounced back significantly. We've grown back many more jobs than were lost during the depths of the recession. And certainly revenues have been back. But you, you know, your question uh, implies something that's very, uh, very, very key. So much of the state's economy is driven by New York City and the downstate suburban counties as well when you get north of the downstate suburbs it's still a very much a mixed picture and while certain regions of upstate new york are are faring much better now capital region uh... hudson valley uh... even around the buffalo area has been a lot of focus you know the buffalo billion and so on you know you go to the parts of the southern tier central new york uh... the adirondacks the mohawk valley uh... you have communities that have fewer people working than there were before the recession hit. You got fewer people living there. Many people have, have chosen to drop out of the labor market uh, completely and some of them have moved away. They moved downstate, they moved out of state. So it's still very much a, a, a tale of two economies and, and, that, and that is a challenge for us. But the strength of the New York City and the downstate economy has certainly uh, had New York State on a, on a strong uh, economic path and that's been reflected then in, in revenues coming to the state. The state budget uh, began for this year's process with, with a budget cap, but that was addressed through the budget negotiation. Where we look at the revenue picture right now uh, in the summer of 2018, uh, 2017 ended in, 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 a, in a somewhat uh, unpredictable way. For most of, of the last fiscal year, we were falling short of the revenue projections. And then uh, starting in December and then going into the beginning of 2018, unexpected uh, or unpredicted spikes on the plus side in terms of revenue coming. And so much of that was in reaction to the federal tax changes and, and, and many people doing their transactions, you know, in 2017 as a way to... Paying taxes yeah, exactly. and some of that. Yeah, exactly. had a lot of that. So it, going into 2018, we still saw very strong collections. April tax collections you know, were strong as well. And so uh, projections were um, uh, increased in terms of expected revenue. Well, now as we head into the summer, we're coming a little short of the updated projections, not to the point of any concern about this year's budget being in balance, because I think we will stay in balance. But it, it certainly points to the fact that this economy, we see it in the stock market with the ups and downs, there's more volatility than there had been. My concern is more long term. You know, when we look at, at, at the financial plan that was recently put out, we still see out year budget gaps and that will accumulate to over 17 billion over the next three or four years. That doesn't incorporate what has been uh, with Governor Cuomo, the expectation that state spending be kept to 2%. So some of those actions that have happened in the past are not included in that projection. But even with that, there will be out year budget gaps that we have to be conscious of. And this strong recovery has been stronger and longer than most recoveries when you look over the long history of, of, of the state and the national economy. At some point, we don't know when, it's going to go in the other direction. I certainly hope we don't have to go through what we went through in 08 and 09. But, you know, both for New York City's budget and New York State's budget, it, it's been very dependent on, on a very strong economy. So the big risk there, um, from my point of view, is, is, is not only economic trends, but, and you touched on in the question, Washington. What's going to happen in terms of, of changes in, in federal policy, most of which we know would target New York in a very negative way? Well, we also have to see what the real impact of the 
of the federal tax changes that no were signed at the en very yeah. end of 2017 really have because yeah. New York is at some of the most risk of real shakeup because yeah. of the changes in the tax code and the, lo and the loss of most deductibility of state and local taxes. Yeah. Let let's get back to that in a second, but let's pull apart a sure. couple of things you said first. So folks um, unfamiliar with all these processes and, and figures should know that the state fiscal year begins April 1st. Yeah. So usually state lawmakers and Governor Cuomo wrap up a budget at the end of March. Um, in some past years, it extended way past the deadline, but that's actually been, um, you know, mostly on time the last several years. And the current fiscal year that began April 1st, we're now a few months into it, was about $168 billion state budget. So big, big, big dollars um, being spent. You uh, are looking at some of those out-year gaps, deficits that need to be closed, especially if revenues don't, don't continue to be so strong. And one of the criticisms of the state budgeting is that the reserves are very low compared to that $168 billion that is being spent. Um, I think uh, my colleague Greg David at Cranes did a, did a smart piece with the Citizens Budget Commission looking at this, saying that reserves are only at about 2% of spending. Is that does that line up yeah. with what you're looking at? Yeah, they're, they're, they're below what would be authorized by statute. Um, they could be over $5 billion that they could have, and I think we're you know, less than $2 billion right now. So it, it's, it's a concern. In fact, this is an area where New York City has done a better job in terms of building up their reserves. We haven't, uh, New York State hasn't made any deposits to the statutory reserve accounts since 2015. You know, so, so this is where we have, you know, very much a mixed picture. We ended the state's fiscal year with a very strong balance in the general fund. Some of that uh, has to do with the fact that, you know, over the past few years we've had these monetary settlements with uh, financial firms, a lot of it an outgrowth of, of uh, the bad behavior during the, the years that led up to the fiscal crisis. But it's not expected that those kind of monetary settlements are going to continue into the future. And some of that money, we had always argued it should be spent for one-time resources, uh, capital investment. Uh, some of it's been used for budget relief, you know, so it, it plugs short-term holes. But, you know, those gaps then, you know, occur down the road. So, yes, New York State is not as well positioned as we should be because we haven't built up those reserves. So if we come to a point where we have that downturn that will happen at, uh, at some point in the future, we are not as strongly positioned as we could have been had we made the decision rather to, to instead of spending all that money, build up those reserves. So that, that's, that's the criticism we've had consistently. And, and the response well, is, I mean, I mean the, the governor and, the, and legislative yeah. leaders seem to be really risking, you know, some, some future crises here by not putting enough to the side. I mean, I know in the city, the city controller has recommended a budget cushion of reserves of at least 10, 11 yeah. percent, and the state is at two. Yeah. Well, look, uh, New York City's had the strongest economy, so no surprise they've done a a better job on a you know on a percentage basis of building up reserves. Although there are some in the city who argue it could be even stronger okay. at the state level. Unfortunately, uh, I think other than our reports, nobody's really and 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 some of the uh, good government groups. Uh, uh, you know, Citizens Budget Commission and others, most uh, don't talk about building up reserves. Well, what happens? You know, I serve in the legislature. Legislators hear from the constituents. They want more money spent on education. They want more money spent on health care. They want more money spent on senior programs. So, you know, one of the um, challenges I think we have, and, and I feel this as someone who spent uh, a long time in the legislature before I became controller, we're so focused on short-term uh, decision-making, getting through a budget for the coming year, getting through a legislative session. Unfortunately, we do not spend as much time on the long-term picture. And that's what we try to do in the controller's office, with our reports, with the analysis, what we put out there to suggest to not just lawmakers and, and the governor, but really to New York citizens, we have to look at the bigger picture. And, and you know, we're going to continue to sound uh, the concern. You know, the problem is I don't have any, you know, some people say, well, Tom, you're controller. You should make them do this. Well, that's not, you know, the, the job is not set up to be a decision maker in that regard. That really is the purview of the legislature and the governor. But it is our job to be the independent voice, to be the least partisan of the offices that are out there, and to try to keep everyone focused on the bigger picture. So we continue to sound the alarm that we haven't done a good enough job in building up our reserves. I know this year is a big political year with the elections. Maybe that's part of why there was an interest in spending money rather than conserving money. But as we go into next year, you know, I certainly hope that we can get back to that issue of building up those reserves. It's not that we haven't had the money, Ben. We just have made other choices, and, and, and some of those probably have not been the best choices. 
Along those same lines, um, you mentioned this this sort of self-imposed 2% spending growth cap. Um, the governor is very proud that his uh, budgets under his watch have grown relatively slowly compared to his predecessors. However, there is some data analysis that shows that they're sort of manipulating the numbers a little bit and, and the spending growth in the last couple of years has actually been a little closer to 4% and that ties in with the lack of money put aside. Does yeah. that also match your analysis? Well, yeah. And in fact, we, we know our analysis of this of, of this budget that was just completed is actually the number is closer to 5%. Five. So it's, it's moving certain spending off budget and so it's not being calculated. So, or, or doing certain prepayments that again uh, cloud the picture as to what the actual growth is. So yes, I mean, I, I, I think that, that that's absolutely the case. And, and similar concern with um, with debt in the state. You know, New York is one of the most highly indebted states in the nation and again, because we have a statutory debt cap, but it, it, it is somewhat porous and you, it can be manipulated as well. So That's, for, so, so for yeah. the layman, you know, yeah. this is all sure. obviously very complicated, yeah. but how much risk is new, because of these different practices, yeah. how much risk is there if there's even a moderate recession? You know, it's hard to quantify, but suffice it to say, the, uh, the, the risks, you know, are clear. If we do have a recession, and it does result in revenues coming in significantly be below what's projected. We already have out-year budget gaps that we have to deal with. If those gaps become even more significant, we don't have the cushion of the reserves to draw on. We are hitting close to our, our statutory uh, limit as far as debt and borrowing. So if you can't draw on reserves and you can't borrow your way out, which is not always the smartest thing anyway, what it's going to mean is tough choices on spending. And we've been through a phase like that, you know, in the not too distant past. So, so the risk is 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 hard to quantify because when there is a downturn, we don't know how significant it's going to be and how New York will fare during that. But I think it's 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 fair to say that that as we head into the next budget cycle, we should be more conservative in our expectations on revenue. Need need to be more conservative as our expectations on spending as well. Because the other piece of it continues to be uh, that concern I touched on earlier, the federal uh, policies. You know, this congressional uh, election in 2018 are going to be key. If, um, not, to, not to be partisan, but the reality is if President Trump gets a continued majority in the, in the Congress and in the Senate, the likelihood of there being continued attempts to change health care financing in the country where New York has benefited significantly to the tune of billions of dollars with the Affordable Care Act, if that gets repealed or significantly uh, changed, if to pay for the, uh, the tax cuts, we are going to see cuts in entitlement programs, safety net programs, education programs, housing programs, uh, emergency response programs that would need to happen to pay for this, uh, this tax cut. Uh, it, New York could really suffer very, very significantly. So that to me is as important a concern, uh, the Trump policies, as the the economic cycle. And and we are not as strongly positioned to deal with all that as we like to be. So I'm hoping the elections will change the balance of power, at least somewhat uh, put a check on some of those federal policies. And, and no one has a crystal ball about the economy. Some experts say, you know, there'll be a recession in a year or two years. Some say not for another five years. Who knows? But with all the concerns that I identified, Ben, it, New York is still a very strong state in terms of our economy. And the reality is our, our economy, especially in the city, has become much more diver diversified. You know, after the last recession, after the dot-com bubble burst and the tragedy of 9-11, Wall Street and financial services really led us out of that time. The bounce back from this last recession, it wasn't led by Wall Street. In fact, Wall Street is still smaller today than it was before the recession. So the fact that the economy in the city and to an extent the state is so much more diversified, that has strengthened us and, and I think will enable us to weather you know, uh, whatever the, you know, the future is going to bring. So one of the key areas of budget spending that could be on the chopping block, and maybe even without a downturn, some um, candidates running for governor say should be on the chopping block anyway, is some of the economic development spending that um, seems to have a mixed result. Some of the Buffalo spending seems to have gone fairly well, other places not so well. You have also been calling for reforms to some of the economic development spending, a clean contracting bill to give your office return to your office some, some authority over contracts. Without getting into all the details, these bills, the Clean Contracting Bill and a database of deals bill to show all the economic development contracts and the return on investment for taxpayers did not pass the budget or the legislative session. Why not? Well, in fairness, they did pass the Senate. 
you know, they which did. is something I expected. And that may have more to do with the fact that there was obviously a break between the governor and the Senate uh, as we headed to the end of the year. It was a missed opportunity. It was a missed opportunity last year. It's a missed opportunity again this year. You know, as I said earlier, we have parts of the state that are still suffering. So, so doing something in terms of economic development is not necessarily a bad idea. We have many programs that have been on the books, and we've audited many of those programs. We've had some newer programs, and certainly you've had a lot of money spent through these regional economic development councils, again, some of which seem to be helping, and others the jury is still out. I think one of the concerns that I've had is that we really don't measure effectively the return on the investment. So very often uh, the, the, the money spent in economic development is heralded with a ribbon cutting at the front end, but years later, how is it really being spent? And we still have these big, gets back to budget reform as well, big chunks of the budget where there's just basically a placeholder of lump sum appropriations, that some of which ends up being spent on economic development, but the accountability trail is not there. And, and look, even with money is being spent in a, in, in a way that's helpful, we've also had uh, criminal charges that have come out of some of the spending. So that, that really undercuts the credibility. So we're going to continue to the extent that we can, our role in terms of auditing some of these programs. We've done some, we're going to do more. And you're right, some of our authority to look over the spending and the contracts was taken away a few years ago in the interest of efficiency. I think it was a not a fair argument because we are very efficient in processing contracts. It is important to have another set, an independent set of eyes looking at these contracts before the money's spent. I can't guarantee that some of what came out in these trials w wouldn't have happened had we had that authority, but I do think folks would think twice uh, before uh, they would do something if they knew that there was an independent review. The database of, of, of deals is very important, again, for transparency and, and accountability. Uh, so we're gonna keep a, a focus on it. Why doesn't it get done? You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think there, there's too often a sense that um, of, of structures that are, arguably done to be more efficient, in fact, end up making the process more opaque. And, and, and to me, you shouldn't trade off um, transparency and accountability in, in the name of efficiency. So, you know, particularly with some of these economic development programs where they've used uh, SUNY and they set up these nonprofits uh, where there's no control or oversight, there's no independent oversight, that was a big mistake. And, and part of the, uh, the other piece of the reform that we propose is, is not to allow those kinds of, of, of nonprofit opaque entities to be used for economic development. So let's just be more forthright. If we want to do money spend on economic development, let's have more metrics in place to evaluate the return we get, and let's have a more open, transparent process. I, I think that would be smart. And, and would certainly provide more integrity to this kind of spending. And as you alluded to with some of the state spending going up and it being an election year, there seemed to be some also some politics at play there. As you said, the governor and the Republican-led Senate sort of splitting and yeah. the assembly not passing the bills that they had said they were in support of before, um, you know, as sort of Democrats are rallying ahead of this election cycle. Um, so in our last five or six minutes here, I do want to move towards the election cycle a little bit. Um, you're running for re-election, as I mentioned, in the open again. One of the biggest, before we get to your election, one of the biggest questions that sort of melds what we're talking about with state finances and the election cycle is whether Democrats will take the state Senate and then likely, depending on what happens in the governor's race, but the assembly will stay Democratic, we pretty much know for sure. If Democrats have full control of both branches of the, uh, both branches of the legislature and the governor's office, there's a lot of talk that taxes will be raised, uh, spending will continue, you know, will, will accelerate quickly. Is that something you're concerned about? I mean, should voters be concerned that that a lot of the talk from many Democrats about raising taxes and spending even more, is that a concern? Well, you know, I've, I've, I've been on the Albany scene for a long time, and I have to say the years I was in the legislature, the Republicans in the Senate were not shy about spending money. Uh, they had their priorities as well, particularly, f you know, for their district. So I, I don't think the argument that Democrats being in control means, you know, more spending or, or more taxes. You know, the reality is that uh, so much of, of what's decided in Albany, whether it's in the budget or, or, or other debates, has to do with regional priorities. You know, so from my perspective, I do think there's a good chance the Democrats will, will win the Senate. And the fact that there's been this dysfunction, particularly with regard to the Republicans not even being able to have all their votes in place, that's why the session ended the way it did. I, I think the, the Democratic Party is will be a diverse party, and uh, the, the regional interests will, will be you know, the key focal point of debate. 
And, and, and I, you know, I live in Long Island, where traditionally there have been a lot of Republican senators versus Democratic ones, but the Democratic senators we have there now, they fight for their community uh, as, as much as a Republican senator will. So, you know, I think the message is for the voters, evaluate the candidates, not just on their party label, but who they are. Um, and and, and I, I think that uh, Andrea Stewart-Cousins, uh, who I've had the privilege to work with for a long time, she is a very responsible and inclusive uh, Senate leader. Some of the problems that happened the last time the Democrats were in charge, which didn't go so well, I don't think that's going to happen with Andrea Stewart-Cousins. And I think it's important to point out that while much of her conference is from the five boroughs of New York City, she comes from Westchester. Right. She already has a broader statewide perspective. And uh, so, yeah, I think, I think uh, the Democrats in charge of the Senate is no reason to be alarmed. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that, that doesn't mean that people shouldn't evaluate the local candidates very, very carefully. Somewhat on the other side of that picture, we're seeing a bit of a reckoning within the Democratic Party. We just saw uh, Representative Joe Crowley lose a primary pretty convincingly yeah. in a shocking fashion. Um, you mentioned you're from Long Island. Uh, Andrew Stewart Cousins, who may be the leader of the state Senate, is from Westchester. You know, there's different pockets of the Democratic Party. Not everybody is a Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan Democrat. How do you see where the, the Democratic Party is right now in New York State, and where do you fit in? Well, the Democratic Party is strong, uh, and I think the response to uh, the Trump presidency is making the party even stronger. I do think there are divisions within the party that are not only in response to the Trump presidency, but, but still somewhat of a hangover from the divide uh, two years ago between the, the Clinton campaign and the, and the Sanders campaign, which I actually thought had healed pretty well by the time Election Day came around. But once we lost, they seem to have, those wounds seem to have been reopened. Look, uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a, in a good Republican uh, neighborhood in a good Republican household. And one of the reasons why I became a Democrat is that I felt the Democratic Party was more open and free-flowing. That certainly is true right now. Uh, our party has a tradition of, of um, internal competition. And, you know, the challenge for Democrats always is not to spend all our time fighting each other because that's often how we end up losing elections in, in, in November. Uh, so I, I think the Democratic Party is benefiting from the energy that's out there. You're seeing a lot of young people um, want to get involved, more women wanting to step up to be candidates. All of that, I think, is good. But I think we, we have to be um, concerned about not, not losing sight of what the real goal is. The real goal is not to beat each other up within the Democratic Party. The real goal is to win elections in November and deliver for people. One reason why I'm a Democrat is I feel the Democratic Party has always stood for the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And, and if we spend all our time fighting each other and, and let the other side win, then we're not going to be able to deliver on that promise. So are primaries like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez just waged against Joe Crowley winning and Cynthia Nixon waging against Governor Cuomo and so on, are those bad for the party or good for the party? You know, I, I think honest, open competition is always good. But, you know, again, after the primary is over, do you come together? So in the case of the gubernatorial primary, will Cynthia Nixon still run on the working families? I don't know the answer to that. You saw Stephanie Miner, former co-chair of the Democratic Party, trying to now start her own, own line. So all of that has the potential to, to dilute, you know, the vote, the Democratic vote for, for governor. And that obviously is the, you know, the key lead in race that will affect the rest of us down, down, down the ticket. So, you know, I do think there is a certain stridency, um, which is the flip side of that, Ener positive energy, it, it, when it becomes too strident and it becomes divisive even internally. Look, the national discourse is so divisive and divided. We shouldn't be encouraging that within our own party. So if you want to talk about credentials, you want to talk about positions, you want to talk about experience, you want to talk about whatever you want to talk about, but don't make it a, a, a so negative on, on, the other, on the other side. And lastly, as we, as we wrap up, in the primaries for uh, the other statewide positions, are you backing uh, certain candidates? I am backing uh, Governor Cuomo and Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul. I haven't uh, uh, done an endorsement in the attorney general race. Uh, you have four candidates that are all friends of mine. They're all good people. Uh, so we'll see how that one goes. Okay. Well... Unfortunately, that's all the time we have, but I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you to State Controller Tom DiNapoli for joining me here today, and thank you for watching this edition of Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm Ben Max. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.